Welcome back to the McMaster University Computer Science course 1JC3, Introduction to Computational Thinking. We're going to finish up today with the topic, what is functional programming? And in fact, that's going to be the first thing we're going to look at in this video. So what is functional programming? So in functional programming, programs are declarative. That means instead of being imperative, saying that something should be done, they're just a statement of properties. And in particular, a program is going to be a sequence of side effect free function defini definitions. So remember, a side effect free function is a function that when you execute it, it has no effects on the side. It does not change the state of your computer. Whatever was in memory will be exactly the same after the function. Whatever was in memory before you executed the function will be exactly the same after you execute the function. And then we produce results by evaluating expressions. So we write down function definitions, then we write down an expression, and we evaluate it. That's how results are produced. And functions are defined as first-class values. What that means is they can be used just like any other values. They can be used like Boolean values or integer values, strings. They can you be, I'll repeat, they can be used just like any other values. So I can have tuples of functions. I can have uh, lists of functions. I can have functions that take functions as input and produces functions as output. They're first class values. Now we will use functions as rules. That's what makes them special. They're not only values, we use them as rules. And in functional programming, recursion plays a crucial role. Recursion is what allows us to define interesting and sophisticated functions. Now, in functional programming, we, we try to avoid two things. One is one is state change. We don't want the state to change. And the other is data mutation. We don't want to mutate data. So what this means is, data mutation is, in many languages, you could have something like a list. And you may want to take this out and put a different number there. Take the list, replace the 2 with a 5. That would be mutating the list. In functional programming, we don't do that. We do as much as possible. We don't mutate things. We don't modify data. What we would do is just create a new list. And this list, the list we had here, would still be there. OK, so this is a basic idea of functional programming. So one important question is, why, why are we interested in this? Well, here are the advantages. First of all, our meaning of our program is much simpler and more explicit. It's simpler and explicit because we don't have any, any side effects. A very common side effect is that you're going to change the value of some variable sitting someplace. We're not going to do that in functional programming. We have no side effects. Things are simpler. And because we have this simpler kind of program, testing and reasoning about the programs is much simpler. And another important thing is because there are no side effects, we can take expressions and move them around in the code. And the meaning of those expressions will not move as you move them around. Now, if you knew, in, if you had code in Java, where Java depends, you have a piece of code that depends on the value of variable x, and you move that code to some different spot, that code could have a different meaning because there could be a different x there with a different value. Also, we have an advantage that the code is going to be more compact. Sometimes it's amazingly compact. And 
because evaluation um, is done without having side effects, evaluation can be performed in parallel. So if we were uh, applying a function to several arguments and we wanted to evaluate the arguments first, we could evaluate those arguments, for example, in parallel. Okay, so these are the advantages of functional programming. Here are some of the leading functional programming languages. Um, there's the oldest group is the Lisp family. These include many, many programming languages, but today the really most popular ones are Scheme and Common Lisp, maybe Clojure as well. Lisp is the second oldest programming language in actual use today. It was done, founded in 1956. It was invented by uh, McCarthy, who was at Stanford, and he was inspired by the work of Alonzo Church. So this is the second time Church's name has come up. And it's a language which is procedural, but also has functional programming. It's both. It's a multi-paradigm language. It has typing, but it is a weak type system with dynamic type checking. This means type checking does not occur before you run the program, it occurs during the program. So this means you may have a serious type error, you may not know about it till your program's running. Now because of this, because of this, people developed a different group, a different family called the ML family. ML stands for meta language. And the ML family, the most popular ones are standard ML and OCaml, and the Microsoft's version, F Sharp. These are, again, procedural plus functional programming, but they have a strong type system with static type checking, which means we can check types before we run our program. We will never have any type errors when we run our program because we won't be allowed to run the program if it has type, type errors, and we'll know about the type errors before we even try to run it. Now these two families are interesting because, because um, clean up this a bit. The ML family is really better for more precise kinds of programming because it allows you to know about type errors before they occur, uh, before you run your program. But the Lisp family is especially known for developing systems very quickly, for rapid prototyping. And people who like programming in Lisp, they like it for that reason. I should mention that Lisp code looks a little strange. If I wrote down this, this is S expression. Uh, Lisp is nothing more than a bunch of S expressions. This means we take that operator right here, plus, and we apply it to these two arguments, and we get back the answer 5. Okay, so that's two of those families. Now, another group are OO families, object-oriented families, plus functional programming facilities. And one you're learning this year is Python. Now Python has functional programming support, but it is limited. It is not, if people who really like functional programming probably will not pick Python as their language, but you can do functional programming in the language. For instance, functions are first class values in Python, unlike in languages like, like C or Java or C sharp. Uh, Ruby and Scala are also these kind of languages. And finally, the last group we're going to look at are relatively pure functional programming languages. Pure meaning we have just side effect free functions, we don't modify state if we can help it, and we don't mutate data if we can help it. And I mentioned three here, Elm, Erlang, and Haskell, and of course you're going to be learning both of these this year. Okay, so those are some of the leading functional programming 
languages. So why are we choosing functional programming for computer science 1JC3? Uh, the reason is, the big, most important reason is the language is simpler than a procedural programming language. It's simpler because there are no imperative statements. Basically, all we do is define functions. Well, we define functions, write down expressions, and have those expressions valued. That's all we do. We have no loops. Now, some of you may say, well, loops are useful. Yes, they're very useful. Why don't we have loops? Because anything you can do with loops, we can do with recursion. And recursion is an extremely powerful tool. And many students find recursion a bit mysterious, a bit scary. They try to avoid it if they can. Uh, since we're programming in Haskell and there's no loops, you can't avoid recursion. Down the road, you're going to thank us for this because it means you're going to learn how to use recursion. Recursion is a tool every computer scientist must be proficient with. So, another important thing about functional programming is it focuses on what, not how. It focuses on what are the functions, not how will they be executed. Like I told you, we the execution is or evaluation is basically done by plug and chug. We don't have to worry about how that plug and chug is done. The implementation takes care of it. Now, there are many uh, programming paradigms, but in my view and the view of many computer scientists, when you sit down and write code, the paradigm you should choose at first is the, pro the functional programming paradigm. So that means when you sit down and write a function, write a procedure, you should write it down as a side effect free function, if at all possible. Now that doesn't mean that you should only do functional programming when you're programming, but it means that should always be your first choice. Because if your program is a function that's side effect free, it's going to be simpler, it's going to be easier to test, easier to understand. So it should be your go-to paradigm. So as a programmer, uh, you should say, well, I write 90% of my code in a functional style. The other 10% I use other styles, like let's say object-oriented. Now testing and reasoning about programs is much easier. And we have this wonderful, wonderful thing that you're going to learn about called quick check. If you want to check whether your program is correct, all you have to do with quick check is basically check the program relative to a property. And then quick check will generate a whole bunch of case test cases for you and see if that property holds with those test cases. This is extremely convenient because instead of focusing on well, what are the right test cases, you focus on what is a property you want to check. For instance, if you were writing code to check um, writing code for the addition operator, the properties you would want to check would be things like the associative law and the commutative law. And you can use quick check and they can quickly check to see if your function seems to satisfy those laws. Okay, so finally, let's talk a bit about why um, Haskell is good for Computer Science 1 JC3. First, it is a well-established functional programming language, probably in many ways the most well-established pure functional programming language. It's highly accessible. You can get it, it's, get it everywhere. It's easy to use. As I said, it's purely functional. It supports recursion, but not iteration. So that means you're going to be forced to use recursion, which is a really good thing. It has a sophisticated static type system, so your programs will never produce type errors when they run. If they have type errors, you won't be able to run them because they won't type check. And finally, and this is crucial, it has an interpreter. This means you can, you can check little pieces of code. You can write down a function, apply it to, the, to input, and see what happens. If you're using a 
programming language like Java or C that do not have interpreters, you've got to write a chunk of code to check little things. When you're first learning programming, interpreters, in my view, are crucial. And this ends this lecture, and this ends all our lectures on the topic, what is functional programming?